Hello everybody, I want to welcome you to a very beautiful day here in Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm on the steps of the British Columbia Supreme Courthouse and of course this is the location of Meng Wanzhou versus the United States of America. It's quite an interesting time to be following China and the United States relations right now and no case is more important than this one involving Huawei's CFO Meng Wanzhou. Now Meng Wanzhou has been under house arrest for the better part of two years, however I do believe that we are very close to receiving a final verdict from the judge to determine if she will be sent back to America to face the bank charges that have been brought against her from the District of New York. Now in today's video, I'm going to be breaking down four main reasons why I firmly believe that Meng Wanzhou is innocent and she will eventually be released from Canada and allowed to return back to China. Let's jump in the studio and break things down. Now, as we get started in the analysis of this case, I want to take everybody back to the very beginning and the actual meeting between Meng Wanzhou and an HSBC employee. Because this meeting that happened in 2013 is really the key event in this entire hearing. Now, HSBC has said that they were misled during a PowerPoint presentation. There has also been some allegations that the HSBC employee that met with Ms. Meng was not a senior executive and that he did not have a deep knowledge of this situation. Let's take a look at who it was that actually met with Meng Wanzhou in this meeting. I'd like to introduce everybody to Alan Thomas, who was the HSBC employee that met personally with Meng Wanzhou during this very controversial meeting. Now we can take a look at his LinkedIn profile that is publicly accessible and see that he was the deputy head of global banking for Asia Pacific for HSBC. Again, this is not a junior level executive. This is somebody that ranks very high within the HSBC organization. And what's very interesting about this meeting is that this was not your typical meeting. This was not done in the privacy of a bank, but yet at a more intimate location. This is a picture of the restaurant where Alan Thomas and Meng Wanzhou met. It is located in the IFC Tower in Hong Kong. And this is also a picture of what it is today. It's been converted into a normal cafe. It is still in operation in Hong Kong. And again, this is a really interesting point to make because the only way that somebody is going to get a meeting with Meng Wanzhou, again, this is the CFO of one of China's largest and most successful tech companies in the world. This is a very high ranking you know, employee within the Huawei organization. There is no way possible that some junior level you know, employee is going to be able to meet with Meng Wanzhou. Of course, it is going to be somebody very high in the rankings in HSBC. And most definitely, you can imagine that that employee most certainly is going to have an intimate knowledge of the business that Huawei does with HSBC. Now, HSBC Bank is claiming that they were misled during the PowerPoint presentation and that they were not aware that actually Huawei was doing business with an Iranian company, thereby exposing them to some apparent risks. However, let's take a look at what Meng's lawyers have shared and why this claim is definitely false. The U.S. record of the case says that Meng claimed Skycom was free of Huawei's control because the company was sold to a third party called Canicola Holdings, when in reality, Huawei held the purse strings for Canicola's finances as well. A bank official tasked with considering risk was well aware that Canicola was under Huawei's control. The HSBC manager knew the whole time that Skycom was sold to Canicola, and Huawei controlled Canicola's bank accounts, and thus, Huawei continued to control Skycom. Now, this is what Meng's lawyers had presented, and it's, again, very clear here. There most definitely was knowledge of this situation, and this is really an important factor that we must establish as we continue to examine this case and prove why Meng Wanzhou is actually innocent. Now, the next part of the video, I would like to examine the actual events that happened when Meng Wanzhou flew into Vancouver International Airport on December 1st, 2018. Now, as the RCMP, which is the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and the Canadian Border Service Agency, CBSA, as these two entities began to prepare this arrest of Meng Wanzhou, there is something that really everybody needs to understand. There was an active arrest warrant for her arrest. And here's the key factor. It was for an immediate arrest. Now, what does immediate arrest mean? Well, it means exactly what the name implies. It means that as soon as there is an opportunity to arrest Meng Wanzhou, you must do that. That is what the arrest warrant does. Now, here's the interesting thing. 
What would normally happen is, is that when Meng Wanzhou walks off the jetway, the RCMP officers would be there and they would tell her that you are under immediate arrest. However, this is not what happened. Instead, RCMP officers escorted her to immigration where she was then questioned by CBSA officers. The CBSA officers required Meng hand over her cell phone, her laptop, and take it even one step further and require her to write down the passcodes to these devices. Now, I want to be very clear in this next part because this is sometimes a little bit confusing. The Canadian Border Services Agency, CBSA, officers are 100% allowed to ask for this information. They can confiscate electronic devices. They can also ask for the passcodes to these devices if there is a question as if this person is eligible to enter into the country of Canada. This is the law. You are allowed to get these devices if you are questioning her admissibility into the country. But here's where things get interesting. Meng Wanzhou was not trying to enter into the country of Canada. She was in transit. And because she's in this transit zone, this is really an important question. She was actually catching a flight down to Mexico. Vancouver and Canada was not her final destination. In addition to that, there is an arrest warrant for criminal activity. And according to Canadian law, it is illegal for CBSA officers to confiscate electronic goods for criminal reasons. Again, the only way they can do this is if they can question her admissibility. Now, the interesting thing about this entire case is, is that it doesn't really matter where you stand. You can either stand on the fact that Meng Wanzhou is guilty or not guilty, but there's one thing that almost everybody seems to agree is that her rights were most definitely violated in Canada. She, and the she is Associate Chief Justice Heather Holmes, who is overseeing this hearing, says she wants the Crown to know that, essentially, even if she doesn't find a conspiracy, she's still open to considering that there may have been misconduct on behalf of the RCMP and the CBSA. And this is really the main thing that we're looking at. There was certainly some misconduct and a violation from both the RCMP and the CBSA officers that were involved in this case. And for further evidence of this potential misconduct, let's look at this article entitled U.S. Asked for Meng Wanzhou's Devices to be Secured at the Arrest. And this is really interesting. What CBSA officers decided to do was take Meng Wanzhou's devices and secure them in a Faraday bag. Now, a Faraday bag is a special type of bag that prevents anybody from accessing the devices and actually remotely wiping them out. Here's the interesting thing. CBSA officers do not have access to Faraday bags. This is not normal procedure for them to do that. However, the officer actually went over to the RCMP officer, asked them for the Faraday bag, and then came back to the immigration area and put the devices in there. This was at the request of the United States officials. Now again, there's a lot of speculation that there was a lot of collusion between the United States Department of Justice, the FBI, the RCMP, the CBSA officers. There's a lot of confusing parts that are involved in here, but you can take a look at the actions and just see why this case is so complicated and why there are so many red flags that are currently being presented. Now, the third point that I would like to bring up in relation to this case is RCMP senior officer Ben Chang. Now, this is really an entire plot twist to this entire story, and I believe is a major red flag. This is senior officer Ben Chang, and this is the interesting thing about this case. He was the senior RCMP officer that was involved in this case, and there are allegations that he was working directly with the FBI and that he sent the electronic information from Meng Wanzhou's personal devices to the FBI. Now, the interesting thing about Ben Chang is that he is no longer with the RCMP. He has actually retired from the force, and interesting enough, he has now relocated to Macau, where he is a high-level executive working inside the casino industry. Now, because Ben Chang is no longer with the RCMP, he no longer has access to the Crown's lawyers. Ben Chang is refusing to come back to Canada to testify for this hearing. Instead, he is actually remaining in Macau. He has hired a personal lawyer and is not giving any statements about this case at all. And this seems to be a very big red flag, especially for Associate Chief Justice Heather Holmes as she analyzes the facts from this case. The known facts include that he, this is again, Officer Ben Chang, was a senior police officer. 
I will take judicial notice of this. She goes on to state that generally retired police officers testify in cases they were involved with before their retirement, and that's not happening here. So again, there is no way to prove exactly what was going on, but again, just the fact that he is so reluctant to come by and fill this obligation to testify on a case where he was presiding really does raise some big red flags for the case and for the Crown as they are trying to make their arguments against Meng Wanzhou. To add in an extra element that even makes this situation more complicated, Ben Cheng's communication, all of his emails, all of his text messages, everything has now been destroyed. And there is a lot of evidence that no longer exists. And by these actions, we can see that this is some potential negligence from the RCMP in this very important case. And all of these factors must be considered as we begin to process the very complex details of this extradition hearing. Now, the final point that I would like to bring up involves the jurisdiction, and this is currently what the lawyers of Meng Wanzhou are pleading to the case right now, is that the United States does not actually have any jurisdiction to actually enforce these criminal you know, allegations against Meng Wanzhou. And let's break down the facts so that everybody's very clear on this. Meng Wanzhou is a Chinese national. Huawei is a Chinese company. HSBC is a UK bank. The PowerPoint presentation that was presented and prepared was done so in the country of China. The meeting, again, where this entire thing started was in the city of Hong Kong. So when we look at this, the United States is not involved in this in any conceivable way. The only case that you can make against this is the fact that HSBC decided to use US dollars and clear these transactions through the city of New York. Now, the interesting thing is, is that that is an entirely separate affair. That is an internal matter, how a bank clears its payments. Again, HSBC is one of the largest banks in the entire world. They have many channels to funnel money, and obviously they're moving a tremendous amount of money around the world. But why is it that HSBC specifically decided to actually clear these funds through New York? Now this is a point that I believe is very relevant and I'd like to bring this up because I think HSBC does not always have the best reputation and has not always acted with integrity. For example, we can notice in this article, families of Americans killed by Mexican cartels sue HSBC for laundering billions of dollars. Now HSBC was caught by the Department of Justice in the United States for actually helping Mexican drug lord launder billions of dollars through their banks. This is unbelievable that a bank would act like this. And this was actually highlighted in a recent film documentary entitled Cartel Bank from Netflix. Now HSBC was actually fined $1.9 billion from the United States Department of Justice for their actions in this. Now the reason that I bring in HSBC and their dirty laundry in regards to this is very important to this case. This is really unprecedented that we see an actual executive of a company being targeted. Again, when HSBC was fined for $1.9 billion, there was not a single HSBC employee that was convicted or charged with these allegations. Simply, the company itself was fined. So this is really some important precedence that I think needs to be understood to really understand this case. If Huawei actually did something illegal, if they violated something with the bank, they would normally be fined from the bank or potentially fined from the Department of Justice. Again, targeting a specific person, especially a high-ranking official, is really unprecedented. And it really does make us speculate that there is probably something more behind this. Now, it doesn't take a genius to understand that the past few years have been very difficult with the United States and with China. At the time of Meng's arrest, Donald Trump was locked in a very decisive trade war between the United States and China. And it also doesn't help the United States case that the former president, Donald Trump, was actually going around the White House boasting that he would potentially use Meng Wanzhou as leverage and potential trade deals with China. There's a lot of speculation that this entire thing is very political. And again, it has been a very big point on why the relations between China and the United States, and unfortunately for the country of Canada that has been brought into this entire fiasco has soured so much. Now, as we conclude this video, I want everybody to realize that the most important thing moving forward I believe is for that Meng Wanzhou should simply be released. This would really be the best for all parties involved. 
The simple thing is, is that she was targeted and that these allegations are completely bogus against her. And again, this is why this case is going on for so many years. When you really peel back the onion and look at the details, there are a lot of red flags. Now, it is my hope as an American citizen and somebody that loves the country of America, Canada, and China, I do hope that this situation can be resolved very quickly. Now, to give everybody a future update, the Meng Wanzhou hearing will continue in the month of April, and we should see a result from Associate Chief Justice Heather Holmes hopefully by the end of April or potentially early May. And I do believe this, this is when we will get this result. Hopefully, for all three countries involved, I believe a non-guilty verdict and allowing Meng Wanzhou to peacefully return to China is going to be a very big step to improving these relations. Everybody, I want to take a moment and thank you for watching this video with me here today. I hope you found these updates to the Meng Wanzhou case very interesting. And again, all of us are going to be looking to the future and hopefully seeing this result that improves relations between all the countries involved. Thank you everybody for your time and I look forward to seeing you in a future video.